Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Canada's hockey hubs swing into action. The players are arriving, and that competition for the cup is about to begin. It's a wonder of the world and the sight of rising COVID cases. Niagara Falls moves to stage three amid spiking numbers. That kind of worries me that there may be a shutdown. We have to start all over again. The CBC's Asha Tomlinson talks to black Canadians about the impact of the Black Lives Matter protests. What is different about this time and this moment? So hockey's back for now. What will it look and sound like? This is The National. It has been gone for more than four months, but in 48 hours, NHL hockey will be back. Today, players poured into the two hub cities of Edmonton and Toronto without some of the usual luxuries. Never has NHL hockey been played so late in the year, but then again, we've never had a year quite like this one. It's hard to overstate the degree of planning behind hockey's return. The rules are rigid. Interactions between players and fans absolutely banned. Now the question is, can hockey resume COVID-free? Rafi Bujikanian with how it's going to work and some excited fans. All that extra COVID cleaning is not just at the hockey arenas. So it's pretty exciting for us. Like I said, we've done it before, but this one's special. We're going to do a really good job on this one, make sure it shines. While in both Toronto and Edmonton, those competing for the real Stanley Cup started to arrive, away from the prying eyes of hockey-hungry fans. Oh, I'm very excited. The four months off was, was difficult to find things to do and watch. And uh, now with hockey back, it'll be like hockey on steroids. Hockey that's carefully monitored at any rate. Nobody without clearance gets past these fences. We think this is an impenetrable barrier from both sides. People who are in the bubble shouldn't be leaving it and people who aren't in the bubble shouldn't be coming into it. While local health authorities say player safety is top of mind and plan to do regular COVID tests. Uh, we are having conversations with the NHL uh, and the local Oilers group about how test results are going to be reported. Uh, and that of course is another metric to follow closely. And so ultimately, I believe that this can be a very safe event. The city of Edmonton is also hoping it can be a profitable event, at least for the chosen few venues inside the bubble. The way the city's taxes work, we won't actually see any of that directly. But for the hotels in particular, who have been able to staff up because of this, um, it will help them pay their property tax bill. Then there are the businesses outside the perimeter, like this restaurant now happy to get fans at their tables with their wallets. The next best thing to going to a hockey game, I think, is going out and watching the game and enjoying some food. As for what it's like where NHL players will be eating and drinking, that's all on the other side of these barriers, where most Edmontonians can't go until October. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. COVID-19 is neither down nor out in Canada. There are two trends that officials are watching. Since early July, when the average rate across Canada of newly discovered cases hit a low point, that rate has been on the rise. So far, the number of people in Canada hospitalized with the virus is still dropping, but keep in mind, hospitalizations can lag behind emerging cases by weeks. Ontario's Niagara region reported nine new cases of COVID-19 today, even as the popular summer destination began to welcome more visitors. Tally Ricci shows us the scene there today. The thundering cascades and stimulating sights are big draws in Niagara Falls. But these days, visitors are a lot more local. I'm visiting from Toronto. Uh, we saw the weather is nice and we said, let's go for a change. This tourist mecca has struggled throughout the pandemic. Business owners looked forward to this weekend of fewer restrictions, which lets restaurants like the Skyline Tower host indoor dining. Here, they certainly noticed the absence of American tourists, with the borders still closed to non-essential travel. We're definitely seeing a lot more people from the GTA than we ever have. We miss our American friends and visitors 
massively. You know, it was a big portion of, of our guests. The room that we're in right now is totally empty. I imagine it's not normally like that. No, th this, uh, this dining room, we normally seat uh, 26 or 28 people in it. Some businesses forced to shutter. This family owned store has struggled. When it first happened, we were like 50 to 90% down. When we reopened, the locals are here and they're starting to slowly come back, so that's a good thing. Officials in the region say it's a delicate balance. Get the economy going again while keeping people safe. If we don't find that balance, unfortunately, I think we would have to start looking at additional measures and hopefully that wouldn't require actually regressing in terms of some of the reopening. Numbers right now on the weekends are probably around 50% of where they should be and where they typically would be, but we're grateful right now just to have people and it's probably better we're not at full capacity. Wow. Because then it's harder to keep a distance. I'm shocked. The area already took heat when this video surfaced online. That kind of worries me that there may be a shutdown because then we have to start all over again. But the city quickly brought in ambassadors to hand out masks and remind people to keep their distance. Avoiding outbreaks is critical to keep Clifton Hill buzzing. It's a good escape, but at the same time, we have masks and we're being careful. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Niagara Falls, Ontario. An outbreak in Haida Gwaii off BC's northwest coast has led to at least 13 new cases. As Barry Stewart shows us, along with infections comes a spike in tensions. Just under 5,000 people live on Haida Gwaii. Normally, the remote and rugged islands host a flurry of tourists through the summer, but officials have urged them to stay away. And now they're also reminding residents to not let their guard down. Take this seriously, and you know it's not a time to gather and, and party and, and do other things um, that will put yourself and your community and your elders and, and those who are vulnerable at risk. 13 cases have been reported on Haida Gwaii and they're linked to residents who traveled away from the island. The Council of the Haida Nation has issued a state of emergency, asking people to pull back their social circles to only include immediate family. And it advises that residents should not travel off island unless essential. Oh, Tension has been rising here over a fishing lodge on Haida Gwaii that continues to operate. But these cases don't appear to be linked to that lodge. Instead, the virus has spread among local residents, which has led to rumors and fear, so some are appealing for calm. I just want to, you know, make this video and just kind of have this conversation regarding the stigma re uh, around COVID-19. We, no, we've been living with this for four months. We've had Susan Musgrave is a writer and owns a bed and breakfast on Haida Gwaii. Um, she says when she came back from medical appointments on Vancouver Island, she was told to self-isolate for two weeks. Council of Haida Nations did everything they could, but it wasn't a question of if it came here, it was when. As long as there are people traveling to and from out of a place, I think there, there is a risk. Which is why officials are urging people to remain vigilant and reduce the risk of COVID-19 spreading through Haida Gwaii's remote communities. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. As for the COVID-19 situation south of the border, Florida is now the state with the second most cases, increasing by 9,300 on Sunday to almost 424,000, surpassing New York with its 411,000. California currently has the most cases, more than 448,000. Donald Trump's handling of the pandemic has hurt him with voters. The latest example, an Associated Press poll that says only 32% approve of his approach. This comes as the countdown to the presidential election enters its final 100 days. Here's Katie Simpson. Unrest again, surging across the U.S. In Seattle, police used tear gas to break up crowds as protesters set fire to a youth detention center and destroyed vehicles. They slashed all four of my tires. They broke my back window out. They rolled on it. You know, I, I, just, I just got off work. I want to go home. In Los Angeles, protesters walked onto the freeway to make their point. And in Portland, violent clashes with federal authorities continued. This standoff is the inspiration for many of the other demonstrations. The Trump administration ordered federal officers to protect statues and buildings there, though they're accused of abusing their powers. Leave our town. Our police were doing a fine job and they're still doing a fine job. 
The president is looking to motivate his base, with the election just 100 days away. Putting on a strong show of force is something Republicans traditionally get behind, and it's part of the reason why he's also ordered federal agents into other cities dealing with gun violence. Trump needs an issue to resonate. A new Associated Press poll finds 8 in 10 Americans believe the country is heading in the wrong direction. Only 32 percent approve of his handling of the pandemic. We are seeing a failure in leadership. So let's go to making people fearful. So it's disappointing, but frankly expected. If Democrats are disappointed, some Republicans are less than enthusiastic. I think, quite frankly, uh, a lot of people like me are frustrated uh, with the divisiveness and dysfunction on both sides and, uh, and don't feel like we have two great choices. The president is putting an emphasis on law and order because his team likes the contrast between him and his Democratic challenger, Joe Biden. They think Trump looks stronger on the issue. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. This was a day of remembrance for an American civil rights leader. The body of John Lewis crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge for the last time. The bridge, the scene of a 1965 civil rights march that would become known as Bloody Sunday for its violence. Lewis's body will lie in state at the U.S. Capitol building in Washington before a private funeral on Thursday. These teams have dedicated this season to social justice. The WNBA dedicating its opening weekend to Black Lives Matter. These players stood 26 seconds in tribute to police shooting victim Breonna Taylor. Players also had her name on their jerseys and have the choice of displaying it in future games. In a Montreal suburb, police are being accused of racial profiling after they ticketed young black men for gathering on a basketball court while young white men were allegedly let off with just a warning. Verity Stevenson shows us how it's playing out. On a hot day in late May, when Quebec was starting to loosen up its rules, Nathan Derry and eight friends met up for a basketball match. They had seen on the news some sports were allowed. Then uh, the police come. They said, uh, we can't play. So it was like, OK, can you talk to us about uh, that was a misunderstanding? They say the officers told them they were done with giving warnings. All nine young black men were given tickets between $500 and $1,500, depending on their age. A total of $11,500 in penalties. We were struck, but uh, it's not about the money, it's about, it's about discrimination. 30 minutes later, some of them saw a group of white kids playing basketball. Derry says cops approached them too, but didn't give them tickets, only verbal warnings. Derry and his friends reached out to local anti-racism groups and now plan to file complaints with police and possibly Quebec's Human Rights Commission. They say racism in their city goes beyond police profiling. A former RCMP officer helping with their complaints says police here do practice racial profiling. This has been a, an ongoing problem for at least for the last 10 years. Others here want action from local leaders. It's very important that we uh, put on place structures or, uh, or programs that are going to help uh, the kids, the community to feel welcome here in uh, Repentigny and to feel that they are home. This mother says she has often thought about moving but won't be pushed out. Things have to change. It's not for us to go away. It's for them to accept the fact that the society is changing. The police say some of the young men had been warned about playing on the court. The men say they weren't and now play elsewhere. Police do say they'll meet with anti-racism activists this week. Verdi Stevenson, CBC News, Repentigny, Quebec. We learned this weekend that Canada's first black national news anchor died. George Boyd was one of the original anchors of CBC News World in 1989. We've got it. It's there. The product's there. And all we have to do now is work harder to better what we have. That was him on News World's launch day in Halifax. He later left journalism to pursue a writing career and became a successful playwright. His work often exploring the stories of black historical figures and communities. Boyd died on July 7th in Montreal at the age of 68. A huge manhunt in rural Nova Scotia is now over. The suspect in custody. I got a text from the chief at about 1 a.m., just before 1 a.m., saying that Tobias was in custody and that uh, there had, it was without incident. And so The relieved mayor of Bridgewater earlier today, police say Tobias Doucette, who was not injured during the arrest, was caught while trying to steal a car. 
Doucette faces charges of domestic assault and trying to kill a police officer. It's been one year since the country watched another manhunt unfold. The search for two B.C. teenage fugitives led police to Gillam, Manitoba, a remote northern town left on edge for weeks. And for some, that feeling hasn't gone away. Here's Austin Gravish. It was an unusual sight. Heavily armed tactical officers, a heat-sensing drone and the RCMP's canine unit. All scouring dense brush for Canada's two most wanted men, teenagers Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski. The hunt would last over two weeks and turn the seemingly quiet town of Gillam and neighboring Fox Lake Cree Nation upside down. Gillam is like a you know, small town, zero crime, and we know each other and a strong community and we love each other. It started mysteriously when American woman China Deese and her Australian boyfriend Lucas Fowler were gunned down on the Alaska Highway in northern B.C. The couple, clearly in love, were on their way to the Canadian Rockies in this van. It broke down. Sandra Broughton and her husband pulled over, offering to help. But Fowler, who knew how to fix cars, politely declined. She's among the last people to see the couple alive. I always kind of wonder what if, what could have happened if they accepted our help. A few days later, police say McLeod and Schmigelski shot University of British Columbia lecturer Leonard Dick before going on the run, ending up in northern Manitoba. For the most part, the community has gotten back to a sense of normal. Uh, there are a few people that are still negatively affected and will always be affected by this. Gillum's mayor says the discovery of the suspect's bodies last August provided relief. I think it would have been a different, totally different scenario if they were never found. But life is different for some here now. Dwayne Foreman says people lock their doors and one man still slept in the living room with a gun six months after the manhunt ended. Police have never been able to figure out a motive for the killings. Mounties say the teenagers had guns, ammunition, and planned to kill more people while on the run up north. The suspects made several videos while on the run. This internal RCMP document references one in which Briar Schmigelski said he and his friend had found a nice little spot by the river where they were going to shoot themselves. That suicide pact and the later discovery of their bodies ended one of the largest manhunts in Canadian history. Austin Grabish, CBC News, Winnipeg. With hockey set to return in just a few days, a pressing question, what will it look like? Up next, the plan to replace this with this. Simulated crowd reactions to certain plays and, and team chants, things like that. From working with video game makers to create crowd noise to finding brand new angles of all the action. An insider's look at broadcasting Canada's game in the time of COVID. Plus, the power of a paintbrush, how artists are shaping the Black Lives Matter movement. And a city search for a teddy bear. I love you, and and the online and offline hunt and the celebs chipping in rewards. Have you seen this bear? We're back in a moment. For millions of people, the return of pro sports is both welcome and a little surreal. With no fans not made of cardboard allowed in stadiums, Major League Baseball is piping in artificial crowd noise to give the experience a boost, leaving team mascots with little to do. The NBA isn't even bothering with that so far, making their games feel almost more like intense practice sessions. So, with no fans in the stands, all the focus now is how it looks on TV. And to get a sense of what hockey night in a pandemic will be like, I spoke to Rob Cordy, an executive with Sportsnet, to see how they'll be handling things. When we turn on the TV for the exhibition games on Tuesday night, is it going to look different? Absolutely. You know, the big thing, of course, that's missing and what we all wish was still there were the fans. That's the thing that people are going to notice first and foremost. And what they won't see, though, is empty seats. The NHL has done a great job in dressing up the arena. It's kind of a combination of the sets that they do for outdoor games, uh, kind of meeting American Ninja Warrior. There's a lot of monitors, staging, fancy lighting, things like that. And so when you tune in Tuesday, you'll see some of that, but it's going to evolve. 
um, as the tournament goes on and the Stanley Cup playoffs move on, you're going to see more and more things added. And once we get to the Stanley Cup final, it's really going to be a spectacular show. And, and what about crowd noise? Do you know, is that going to be pumped in? That's part of it. Um, EA Sports has been working very hard with us and, and with the league in creating samples and audio samples that, that will be experimented with. We're taking an approach of we're going to kind of crawl, then walk, then run. And so you'll, there'll be a crowd bed to start. And then as we move on, we'll be adding more samples like uh, simulated crowd reactions to certain plays and, and team chants, things like that. So uh, it, it, what I've heard has been pretty good. It's very authentic, and I think it'll add to the broadcast experience. Many of us who watch hockey uh, have watched basically the same way that a hockey game has been shot with some minor changes over the years. Now you can put cameras anywhere, I guess. You don't have to worry about getting in the way of fans uh, in the stands because they won't be there. Are we going to see radically different camera angles? Will hockey look different? Yes, there's some new camera angles that we're trying out. One in particular is called the Jitta Cam, which uh, is a long arm that hangs down from the scoreboard and it can, can go 360. So that's going to be part of the broadcast. And now our crews are on site in Toronto and Edmonton and they're experimenting. You're right, there's no fans in the stands, so the traditional camera platforms don't necessarily need to be used. So they're going to experiment a little bit, but there's always a danger in that, um, you know, the coverage of hockey is, is very solid and it has been tweaked over the years to where it is in a really good spot. And you also have to make sure what you're presenting here, uh, can you bring that to the broadcast once we get back to our normal state? So there'll be some experimentation. Some stuff will look very, very similar to what people expect and there'll be some new stuff. One of the things I've learned in television news is you never really know how it's going to look and how it's going to work until you actually get on the air. Is that the same for you? Absolutely. And, you know, we start on Tuesday with a, a doubleheader of exhibition games. And, and like I said, from the start of exhibition to the Stanley Cup finals, these broadcasts are going to evolve significantly. There's so many new technologies and so many new ideas. We're going to experiment, see what works, and then we'll refine the product. And once we get to the, the, the final round, we'll be in really good shape. We've talked a lot about the technical thing, but let me finish with a question about COVID in terms of the infection risk about the medical part of it as a manager uh, for Sportsnet how concerned are you about that well we're very concerned in, in terms of health and safety has been our really our only priority throughout the the COVID-19 situation and and creating these bubbles that the NHL has done they've done a really nice job their health and safety group has been very very stringent on what the rules are and what they're going to allow uh, so we are comfortable um, in terms of sending our people into the bubbles to do these work. They've already been tested three times before they left. And yesterday, everybody left to, to go to Edmonton. So, so far, so good. And we know that the NHL is very, very locked down on the rules and we expect them to, to uphold them. And so, yeah, you're always a little bit nervous. Um, but I think all the steps have been taken as much as you can to keep everybody safe. So going into it, I'm, I'm pretty confident uh, we'll be fine. Well, many of us are excited to have hockey back. I'm sure you are too. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, Ian. And some sad hockey news tonight. Legendary Toronto Maple Leaf Eddie Shack has died. To shake things up, Imlock sends out Eddie Shack. Seconds later, Shack and Ferguson collide with predictable results. Nicknamed the Entertainer and the Nose, Shaq spent nine of his 17 seasons with the Leafs. Four of them as Stanley Cup champions, including the last time in 1967. Eddie Shaq won legions of fans as a colorful agitator who loved to mix it up. After retiring in 1975, Shaq revealed he couldn't read for most of his life and he became a literacy advocate, commercial spokesperson and entrepreneur. Some of you may remember Eddie Shack Donuts. Shack died this weekend from cancer. He was 83. Here comes Shack. He knocks him down and he gives him a whack. <laughs> Apparently, a former number one song. And next on the national special programming ahead of Emancipation Day on being black in Canada. There needs to be a lot more like systemic change. We hear from black artists laying out a powerful message, and... Everything that was being taught did not talk about her. Parents seeking representation in the classroom, the push to diversify school curriculums. Next.
In the months since the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police, protests continue to ebb and flow. And while in the United States the movement is under pressure with a presidential election in play, both there and in Canada the demands remain for an end to anti-black violence and discrimination and a wholesale change to policing and to police funding. As we approach August 1st, the date slavery was abolished in the Commonwealth in 1833, the CBC is airing special programming all week on being black in Canada. And for The National, Asha Tomlinson explores how artists and activists continue the movement for racial justice on Canada's streets. Black Lives Matter, three powerful words echoed right across Canada and North America. Everywhere we've seen people filling our streets, taking part in peaceful protests to amplify that message. And it is loud and clear here in this Toronto neighbourhood. When you see this, you see something that's not traditional. When we're fighting something that seems so systematic and so traditional, you know. What is different about this time and this moment, do you think? I think George Floyd's killing was as cruel as any one of us has ever seen. We are supposed to be mm. the highest form mm. of God's creation, the highest form. And to see somebody take another human's life in that form, I think that is what resonated with everybody. We're facing this, we're learning it, um, we're recognizing our privilege, and I think that's going to evolve into a really big change. The conversations are happening. There's a heightened awareness around the injustices of racism, privilege, power. There is no such thing as a black problem. This is a human race problem. Dub poet and activist Kiosha Love delivered that speech in Toronto back in May. It's a long journey and it doesn't really stop at a protest. We're stopped. I caught up with her here, a tribute to black lives lost. When you see this graffiti alley, and the images like this one. What do you make of it? How does it make you feel? I think it makes me feel both empowered but sad. I think it's beautiful that we're um, commemorating these beautiful um, souls that were lost, but also how sad it is that it has come to this. Two months later, what would you say? Where is the dial? We're tackling things head on, even when it makes us uncomfortable, feeling a bit hopeful. And I think the dial is kind of turning. What does being black in Canada mean to you? I'm reminded by my own ancestors and the people around me, my black counterparts, that we are powerful. We are so powerful um, that even the things that we are constantly holding, the weight that we're constantly wearing, it will never stop our shine, it will never stop our success, it will never stop you know, the way that we use our voices, and I think that's powerful, and I'm, I'm always keeping that with me, the power in my voice and the power in who I am. Danilo McCallum's power is paint. He contributed to the Black Lives Matter mural. Are you seeing change? There needs to be a lot more like systemic change. Like we need to see the actual pe black people in positions of power for this to be a meaningful change. That dynamic needs to shift. And there are many more leaders making waves across Canada, prioritizing wellness and mental health, using art to send a message sharing their stories of police brutality, protesting, writing, building a more inclusive society one step at a time. Asha Tomlinson, CBC News, Toronto. The Being Black in Canada special programming continues throughout the week. You can catch it all, including the special that aired today, on CBC Gem, and learn more by visiting cbcnews.ca slash beingblackincanada. Racism doesn't just define and discriminate, it can also diminish, which is why there are growing calls across the country to include the experiences of black Canadians in school curriculums. And as Deanna Sumanak johnson explains, this goes beyond black history. Charlene Grant has always taught her children about their history as black Canadians because she says their schools didn't. <laughs> well, my child was in grade 10 and she realized <laughs> History class, everything that was being taught did not talk about her. 
she gave her daughter a plan. This is how you fight that. Every assignment you get, do it on the black experience, what was happening at that time. Half of our black students aren't making the choice to pursue an academic stream in high school. In recent our weeks, Ontario got rid of the practice of streaming in high schools, which was found to steer black students away from university track courses. But advocates like Grant demand more change. The curriculum is, is key. In Nova Scotia, there are two African-focused elective courses at a high school level, but this professor says that's not enough. When we're in science, we should be talking about black scientists. When we're in math, why aren't we talking about black contributions to math? So often, even when black subjects are being taught, they're ghettoized into black history. The push to make the black Canadian experience a more central part of the curriculum isn't new. But many feel that right now, the focus on fighting systemic racism might mean something will come of it. Make this, if you will, a teachable moment, how we can strengthen the uh, curriculum ties. BC's uh, Minister of Education has been consulting with black history organizations. I want to believe in their honesty and I want to believe that they truly want to make a change because we want to live in a society that is fair for all of us. And Charlene Grant thinks now is the time too. Her oldest son is off to university, but her youngest still has lots of years left in the public school system. I want my children to have a better a better, um, a better future, a better chance. It's one of the reasons why I go, because I'm hopeful. Hopeful that a day is close when students of all backgrounds will learn about black history as a part of learning about Canada. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, the national interview with Eugene Levy. The motel set was actually our, our home. It felt like home to us on the set. The Canadian comedy legend on working with his real-life family, creating a world without homophobia, and saying goodbye to Schitt's Creek. Right after this. The 2020 Primetime Emmys are the first major American award show during the COVID-19 pandemic. Saturday Night Live alum Leslie Jones will announce this year's nominees virtually on Tuesday. The cast of the CBC comedy Schitt's Creek is expected to pick up several nominations again this year. The show's final episode aired back in April, but perhaps the pandemic and all of this recent time as home has brought in new viewers or longtime fans looking for comfort in the Rose family. So tonight we wanted to revisit an interview Andrew did with Eugene Levy back in January about the show's message and its legacy. It looks like your great grandfather's your great grandmother right up the ass. Ronnie, throw the thing. <laughs> Schitt's Creek has officially arrived. The story of the once filthy rich Rose family, with attitudes to match, by the way, quickly created a cult following. You better remember which nails you pulled those wigs from because your mother keeps a spreadsheet. The Canadian born and made sitcom has since exploded in popularity, picking up awards, sparking international buzz, and ranking right up there with the heavy hitters with nominations at the Emmys and the SAG Awards. Way to go, son! Go the way! Ah! Co-created by comedy legend Eugene Levy and his son, Dan, Schitt's Creek is packed full of the weird, me, me, hey, me, me. the wild, I tried, John, but I can't, and the outright absurd. We also have wings! But it also breaks ground, fearlessly representing queer relationships and issues free from hate or judgment. So, as the final season is about to begin, I met with Eugene Levy to talk about the power of comedy and saying goodbye to Schitt's Creek. Mr. Levy, very nice Drew. to meet you. How are you? Good, good. Excellent. Are you having your coffee? I, I will drink mine if you drink yours. Yes, Although I, will. I think yours is cold. <laughs> Maybe we can uh, we'll get a, a warm, warm cup for you. It may be cold, but, but this is where acting comes in. <laughs> Pretend mm. you're Oh, oh, good. Wow, that's hot. I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> season six. <clears throat> Air soon. Um, shooting's all wrapped up. Shooting is done. So tell us all about it. Um, well, it's a, I think the, uh, the, the resolution to the series, I think, will be, will be uh, something that, uh, that will be embraced by our fans. Um, 
I think it ends. Not giving me much. <laughs> I, oh, you're not getting anything, Andrew. No, no, so, just, some some kind of plot hint, some kind of teaser that would. No, I I I, I I'm just saying that there are, um, you know, there may be one or two uh, surprises. <gasps> 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 But everything kind of ends the way I think it should end. Can you tell me about the last day of shooting, what that was like for you? Well, the last day of shooting, we had kind of a, we, we had kind of a, um, it was an interesting final week because every set that we wrapped on, like every, uh, every the last scene we did in the motel, for instance, was a, a very, very emotional kind of experience. There were a lot of, like, tears. When actors would finish their last scene together, there was just 10 minutes of hugging and, you know, crying. The motel set was actually our, our home. It felt like home to us on the set. The last scene we did in there was a very emotional scene where Johnny actually says, I think we're gonna miss this little place. Hmm. And, you know, that was, and then of course, you know, tears start happening again, and then you gotta dry and retake. Um, yeah, it was very emotional. There is an episode that I wanna ask you about, and, th and this was from the most uh, recent season, I think, and, and it's the episode where your character accidentally out David's boyfriend to his parents. You know, mixing a business relationship and a romantic relationship, well, that can get kind of tricky sometimes. In crafting that episode, I mean, you made some very deliberate choices about how that would unfold. Right. Tell me about crafting that episode. I think Dan takes credit for, for that story and, and kind of crafting how it it actually uh, came out. He is still the same person, and it, it's his birthday. And David, we're not upset about Patrick being gay. No. Oh my God. <laughs> For a minute, I thought this was gonna get very dark. <clears throat> well, the thought that Patrick was feeling like he couldn't come and talk to us about this. You've seen storylines uh, with, uh, about gay characters, um, who are always hitting an obstacle of some kind where you have a parent who is upset at the fact that their child is gay or can't deal with it. Um, because what we've created with the town itself of Schitt's, of, of Schitt's Creek, the, the, the idea that it, that the, the idea of making it an all-inclusive devoid of homophobia um, the idea is that Patrick's parents would not be upset. Happy birthday, my sweet boy. But you really wanted to avoid that tension, that the yeah, kind of tension we've yeah, seen. Yeah, it's spearheaded by Dan. I mean, that, that, that was an important thing. Uh, the same way it was an important thing that he uh, play a, a pansexual as a character you know, which even six years ago was, um, you know, a very, very kind of gutsy thing to do. I do drink red wine, but I also drink white wine. Oh. And I've been known to sample the occasional rosé. And a couple summers back, I tried a Merlot that used to be a Chardonnay. Oh. which got a bit complicated. Okay, yeah, so you're just really open to all wines. I like the wine and not the label. Does that make sense? The legacy of Schitt's Creek, by the end of it all, is that it will have accomplished what? I think, I think the message that this show is sending out in a <laughs> certainly not so subliminal a way is a very positive message about acceptance, inclusivity. I'm not a big uh, social media person, but I do kind of look at the tweets coming in, and I do notice that a lot of them have to do with gay kids who say that it's because of this show they were able to uh, come out, using the show uh, to help them um, in their coming out to their, 
to their parents and their families. Um, uh, one, one letter came in uh, last week about a couple, um, tragically, who lost a child in the past year and talked about the show as um, a way of, of them experiencing something that they never thought would happen again, which is to be able to laugh. Um, and it's those messages and those letters that um, kind of reinforce the fact that I guess what we're what the what the show is doing is much more than just being a, a hot, good half hour comedy. It's actually sending uh, it's it's trying to actively change the way people see things, you know, create a more positive light on things that need to be lit a little more. I saw a framed photo that you had given your son on the last day of shooting. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, had you seen his reaction to that photo when Vogue asked him about it? It was in his house. He picked up the photo and he showed it. Did you see, have you seen that no. clip? Can, can we, I, so we have it here. I just wanted to show it to you at the same time. Wow. But it's, it's just a very short, short little snippet. So here we go, I'll play that for you. A photo of my family and a photo of me and my dad. My dad actually gave oh. me this little framed photo on the last day of shooting our show. What's it say on that? Um, it says, Daniel, it was an honor being your partner, son. Dad, XO. <laughs> oh, no. I don't want to cry for you, Vogue, but I just might. You're so lucky to have a father like him. He is a lovely, lovely, sweet, generous man. <laughs> you hadn't seen Good. that. Yeah, lovely. Mm. Lovely. Um, well, that's... You know, that's six years of working with a very, very talented young man. It was just an amazing experience watching him grow as a writer, as a producer, uh, as an actor and uh, director for the past couple of seasons, directing a few episodes. Um, yeah, just really makes, you know, my heart swell. We love you both very much. Love you too. Love you too. <laughs> What's next for Eugene Levy? Uh, hopefully a little more golf. <laughs> um, I don't know whether I want to necessarily hop back into another um, series, but um, I'll kind of look at little things that kind of excite me um, creatively and, and and you know and do that and hopefully have more time in between projects to spend with my wife Deb and maybe travel and uh, or or do nothing uh, <laughs> but it's nice to actually be able to get up in the morning and and just think about you know where you want to go for lunch as the hottest thing on your agenda if you end up taking a break uh, you'll have earned it Eugene Levy thank you very much hey, for thanks so really much thank you all of that, of course, pre-pandemic. Next on The National, a bit of celebrity help as the city searches for a lost teddy bear. They have my bag that all of Vancouver is rooting for finding mama bear. The hunt for a deeply meaningful keepsake in our moment. In Vancouver, people are on the hunt for a stolen teddy bear. The custom-built toy contains the recording of a dying woman's loving message to her daughter. Marilyn Soriano died from cancer last year. This weekend, actor Ryan Reynolds offered a reward for the bear's return. Vancouver's act of kindness is our moment. My friend messaged me and he's like, hey, like, Ryan Reynolds just tweeted about you. And I was like, what? And then I looked on Twitter and I showed my fiance. I was like, look, Ryan Reynolds. And then just sobbing, just immediate, like, I am so grateful for him like it's just so amazing like how he has vancouver's back she gave me this bear to remind me of like home and in it the recording was 
Mara, I love you. I'm proud of you. Like, wherever you are, like, I'm always with you. No matter where you are, a part of me will always be with you forever. I love you to infinity and beyond. It means everything to me because I would hug that bear every time I missed her. You know, like, the messages of, like, kindness and, like, just people telling me that, like, they have my back, that all of Vancouver is rooting for finding Mama Bear. Like, like as, as devastated as I feel, it's just kind of heartwarming to see something so positive coming out of something so negative. So my colleague, CBC reporter Deb Goebel, originally did a story on that that was retweeted 25,000 times. So the message has gone far and wide, including, as we saw, to Ryan Reynolds. And in turn, that's been retweeted. But here's the thing. We need to find that bear. There was other stuff that was stolen in the knapsack, but somebody in Vancouver has got to be able to see where that bear is. So let's keep our fingers crossed. That is a national for Sunday, July 26th. Good night.